my friends, if you are watching this channel, I think it's safe to assume that you do not come here just to hear what you want to hear. The videos that we put out, specifically these ones, where I just monologue with you, they are not your go-to source for having your current paradigms reinforced. At least, I hope not. I hope also that they don't just try to fill you up with some other idea than the one you have. In fact, what I'm really trying to do here is to help us all, and you're helping me at the same time, to help us all free our minds of a lot of the social conditioning that we're under so that we can think more freely and clearly for ourselves. A, a recent video I did on UBI it spoke about our mind's tendency to jump into reaction mode. Now, when our beliefs are challenged, most of us have learned along the way, our social conditioning is to equate our idea with our ego. So when one of our ideas is challenged, our ego feels challenged. And then we go into defensive mode. Not only do we not hear the person who's talking with us anymore, but we're unable to see anything deeper in our own mind or to process any more information. We lock down onto a certain set of information that corresponds to our idea. And we can't see outside of it. Since you're here, again, I'm going to assume, because you want to free your mind of that tendency, I'm going to jump into another thing that is maybe even more reactive than UBI for a lot of us. And this is the idea of what a lot of people call conspiracy theories. Now, instead of conspiracy theories, I'm going to call these big plan theories. Because conspiracy theory, I think that does a disservice to these. If, if we study these conspiracy theories, we will find that some of them had a lot of relevance. Some of them were showing things that were true. And there's, there's another benefit to conspiracy theories, before I rename them. <laughs> and that is that they open our mind to different possibilities. Now, that being said, they also can close our mind to any further possibilities. So if we really want our mind to be free, we have to understand what these big plan theories are, how they affect our minds, and see them with a new clarity. I call them big plan theories because they usually are involved with the idea that there are some hyper-intelligent people, or in some cases, people feel they are aliens, but in any case, some hyper-intelligent beings <laughs> who are able to manipulate these vast social systems that we are all taking part in. And sometimes they're covering things up, but even if they're covering things up, they're doing so in order to manipulate things to their ends and usually to use us as pawns in their game. As with UBI last time, I'm not here to say that these big plan theories are true or false, but I am here to hopefully allow us to see how they operate in our minds and to not be locked down by them, to take the beneficial parts out of them, in other words, the parts of them that open our mind to new possibilities and to shut down the parts 
that close our mind off to seeing any additional evidence. To understand how these operate, we have to understand something about our minds. And I'm going to break our minds down into our, our fear-based mind and our, our thinking rational mind. And so when I talk about these two different minds, we'll see that that's an artificial breakdown, but it's useful, I think, for understanding what's going on up here. So we can understand that our, our minds, and I'm speaking about our fear-based minds here, our fear-based minds do not appreciate ambiguity. In fact, they fear ambiguity and are very uncomfortable with it. Now, if you're into rewilding at all, you understand that we all live in a culture and we've been conditioned to seek out comfort. We have been taught that we should wear enough clothing so we aren't cold outside. We certainly should not go out naked and lay down in the snow or roll around in it. Matt? <laughs> we are taught to seek out the things that are most comfortable to us. And this happens with our minds as well. Our minds love the idea of non-ambiguity. So in other words, we can make maybe two guesses about the world. The one is that big plan theories are real. There really is somebody driving this giant bus, this runaway bus. There's somebody at the steering wheel. And whether that is a leader who we believe will save us all, or it is nefarious forces, our mind takes comfort in knowing that there is a driver. Because if there's a driver, it implies that it's possible for either to get a really good driver up there, that leader who's going to save us all, or it would be possible to boot out the nefarious driver and for us to take that driver's seat. Now the other possibility is that there's this giant speeding bus we're all on and there's no driver at all. In fact, there's not even a steering wheel. Our fear mind that does not appreciate ambiguity, to that fear mind, that is terrifying. And it does not want to even consider the possibility that we might all be on a runaway bus. It's very comforted, and that comfort-seeking ah, oh, just comes in and, and makes us feel so good, so secure, when we can imagine that there's a driver. And that's part of why our minds really want to grab onto big plan theories. They really want to know that there's a driver. So knowing that our mind is comfort-seeking, our conditioned mind is comfort-seeking, because I would say our real mind this mind over here that is not the fear-based one, it thrives in discomfort. It loves the thrill of feeling oh, that cold shock as you roll in the snow. It loves the feeling of being hungry and knows that hunger is the best sauce. This is, I'm going to almost say, is our, our better self. This part of our mind that doesn't fall into the trap of always seeking comfort. So knowing this about our mind, let's move forward and think about these big plan theories a little bit. And what I'm going to try to show you here is that whether they're, they're true or not, it's not much use for us to spend energy believing in them. Here's why. Our, our social systems, I'm talking about our economic systems, the, the social trends of our thinking, all political trends, environmental trends. These social trends, social movements, the direction that we go, these are gigantic, highly complex systems that I'm going to suggest, and, and I'm just saying this looking around at 
some of the most intelligent people that I know, way brighter than I am, and these people, despite being brainiacs with such gigantic brains, cannot understand or correctly predict how these social systems operate. I tend to have a doubt that there's anybody out there that's actually that smart, that's actually intelligent enough to understand these social systems and understand them well enough to manipulate them to their desired results. Now, if, if there are people who are that intelligent, why do I think that they aren't manipulating the big plans that I'm taking in and getting me to think the things they want me to think, not only through their covert actions, but through feeding me big plan theories that feed in with their desires. Because, again, if they're that smart that they can run these huge social systems, why are they not smart enough to not think of using these big plan ideas to manipulate us? We can notice a little bit that when we look at a, a given big plan theory, our mind tends to be constrained to the things we've heard, usually online. And few of us think past that. And I'll give you an example. I have some friends who do not believe the virus is real. One of their arguments is that the virus, they say, is, has not been seen. We don't have tests that can accurately see and we don't have pictures of it. We don't have direct evidence. Now, despite what we think of that assertion, their next assertion is that it is 5G that is causing this instead of the virus. So it's this 5G technology that is making us all sick. But I, I started thinking and looking around online, and I found it very interesting that people are questioning the virus for what they consider to be lack of evidence for its existence. But no one's questioning if 5G is real. And it didn't take me long to sit down and think about an imaginary situation where the CEOs of Verizon and Sprint and the cell phone making companies, smartphone making companies, these CEOs, they all sit down and they say, hey, you know what? We could make a lot more money as the years go by if we take these phones and we throttle them to a certain data speed, a certain data limit. And then let's come up with these new launches of this new technology that allows the new phones to speed up. So, so we'll make people continue to buy new phones and upgrade their services and we'll make tons more money. Let's keep it simple. Let's just call it G and we'll have 1G and 2G and 3G and 4G and 5G and 6G. We could just keep going. And every time we launch it, we'll sell tons more phones. This is genius. This is so smart. This rocks. Could it be? that there is no 5G. And if we think there's 5G, what is our evidence for it? So the reason I bring that imaginary scenario up is to show that our minds will latch on to the elements of a big plan that we've been told about, but will seldom question deeper. And this gives us a great clue as to how our minds work and operate. There's that fear-based side over here that is saying, give me an answer. I don't want ambiguity. I want to know. I want to have an answer. And once it grabs onto an answer, then 
It filters out, won't even listen to information that is coming in that threatens that idea. Now, if you love big plan theories, that may be happening to your mind right now. Your mind might be saying, look, filter this out. Don't listen. 5G is real. Of course it's real. And the virus isn't. But there's probably a part of your mind over here that says, okay, well, am I applying the same standards to wondering if 5G is real as I am applying to is the virus real? If we look at any big plan theory, we can find these little hidden things in it. And that brings us to wonder that if there really are masterminds behind all of this, I mentioned this before, wouldn't they be smart enough to litter the media landscape, the online landscape, with big plan ideas that furthered their thoughts? Might they not be thinking, for instance, well, let's start to instill a fear of technology in people. Technology is obviously this immensely powerful tool. And if the common people can be afraid of it and distrustful of it, then, ah, yeah, this could work. We would have more control of technology. And even though that technology would be available to the common person, they will tend not to use it because they fear it. Yeah. That's where my mind takes this. It says, wow, super geniuses. Why do I think then that I would be seeing into their plans? If they're that smart to manipulate these gigantic social systems, why are they too dumb to keep me from seeing behind the scenes? of their plans. And furthermore, it's basic, uh, am I using the term psyops here correctly? <laughs> it's, it's a basic psychological tool to then feed people information that's going to continue to lead them in the direction I want them to go. And that, to feed people the big plans that they want us to believe would be way easier, way easier than manipulating these giant social systems that they are supposedly manipulating behind our backs. Now, if you're still with me, I'm going to propose something on this side of our mind. And this side of our mind, this is the discomfort side. I'm kind of willing to wager that all of you who are watching this are people who are willing to go to the discomfort side. I mean, I'm always promoting silly stuff like trying new things, like going and getting cold, taking cold showers, doing all this uncomfortable stuff, and suggesting that behind that discomfort, are, there's great gifts waiting there for us. And I'll say the same thing today that if we are willing to go into the uncomfortable place, that place of ambiguity, that there's something waiting for us there, and something that actually could be life-changing. Because here's the thing. Believing in these big plan ideas takes a lot of mental, emotional energy. I probably spend a lot of time looking online, trying to look at additional evidence for this, I probably have emotional feelings of anger, frustration, that the driver up in front is a nefarious being and is manipulating me. I'm probably having feelings of being small and impotent. I might be that person that says, I'm going to rise up and stand against this. But then I notice, that part of my brain notices, well, you know what? I'm not. I'm still just sitting here watching stuff online. And so that schism inside of ourselves, that is, that takes mental, emotional energy. And when we go over here to the discomfort place, there's going to be some initial discomfort for sure. 
but we're going to reclaim all that energy that we were using in believing in these big plan uh, big plan theories and i'm going to argue when we have that energy and it's at our command there's positive things we can do with it that could actually enact change make us feel less impotent and actually make us less impotent okay so here we are on this side we're going to venture over into this idea that there's no driver maybe not even a steering wheel this whole bus is basically going <laughs> where it's going based on where we're leaning. Our little actions inside the bus are having small impacts on the careening path of the beast. Now, if we all could lean one way together, rocket, whatever, we might be able to affect the physics of this bus in its travel but in general we're all just flopping around in different directions and the bus is just going on its own now to me at least this seems more likely when i look at people that are extremely powerful in our culture they they seem to be just at the mercy of ego circumstances have created a situation where they are in a position of power or money, but most of them, I think, are just feeding their egos and trying to get more and are at the mercy of these social systems. And it's almost as if instead of us or any masterminds running the social systems, the social systems have created so much momentum that they're running us. We can see this in ourselves if, I think, we, if we're honest with ourselves and we look and we say, okay, yeah, the more I look into my mind, the more I see that my thoughts, my ideas, a lot of these are social constructs that I've picked up along the way. Where's the real me? Where's my real actual beliefs? Where are they? And that is a, is a deep, spiritual, if you will, question that takes a lot of time to answer. The easier reaction is just to spit out the ideas that we've heard and say, these are my ideas, without really examining them. So if I go over here into ambiguity land and I am willing to tough out the discomfort, then here I am realizing that there's nobody in charge. <laughs> There's nobody driving. And our collective actions, the way that we move in the bus, our collective actions are the only thing that have influence and power over this journey we're all on together. Now, I have moved from victim, thinking of myself in a victimhood sense, to thinking of myself as the responsible person. This is promoting personal responsibility. So if I have fears about a cashless system, look at my own actions. Am I using credit cards or am I using cash? Am I contributing to that direction that the bus is going towards being more and more cashless? That is a harder question to ask ourselves. It's much easier to say, this outside force is making me do it. It's much tougher to take responsibility and say, okay, I make the decision. And guess what? If enough of us make that decision, then we start to rock the boat one way or another. And we might think, no, there's the people in power. They're the ones that decide. So they want our money. Right? I mean, Amazon's not there just to be a website. It's there and exists because we're going there and we're buying stuff from them. And if enough people said, sorry, I have to use a credit card or PayPal or whatever, and I'm only going to use cash, so I'm not going to be using Amazon, that's going to impact Amazon. 
and that's going to impact that social system. Now, personally, I don't consider myself smart enough to know what that impact would create, where those ripples would go out and how it would affect us all. But it is fairly clear to me that we do have power to influence, especially if we're all acting together. Because there's so many of us, it's very easy to think my actions don't make a difference. But if this is all just the collective actions of all of us, then we do have influence and power. And in a way, saying, oh, my actions don't matter, that's just a cop-out. It's just going back over here to the fear-based thing. It's not saying, hey, I'm going to take responsibility. I am really going to make my actions correlate with the way I want to see the world go. And yes, I might not be smart enough not one of those masterminds to understand exactly how my actions are going to impact, but at least we can do our best. And we can act out of basic natural human values of compassion and love and caring. I can help out my neighbor and I can change my consciousness so that I am not thinking of the people around me as the enemy. Uh, the people around me as ignorant. Now, I might say that the people around me could all use a helping hand, myself included, in helping ourselves to think more clearly, helping ourselves to examine things more critically. When I'm given a, an idea, like 5G instead of the virus, am I really looking at it? And can we help each other to undermine each other's beliefs? We love it. This part of our mind loves it when people come and say, your belief is right. That's what we want. We don't want the ambiguity. We want to know we're right. But what if we embrace ambiguity? What if we say, let's take all our beliefs. Let's undermine them. You know, personally, I don't know if there's masterminds behind it. I don't know if there's aliens behind it. <sighs> I don't pretend to know any of those things. All I can do is surmise. All I can do is look at the evidence around me. And for me, I find myself better at questioning evidence than accepting evidence. Because if I read something online, who's writing that? I know nothing about them. What are their motivations? From what I've seen of human motivation, most of the time, we just want people to believe what we believe because then we feel more secure in our beliefs. We're extremely ego-driven. Despite us thinking of ourselves as so intelligent, which is maybe why we can have this idea of masterminds, because we believe somewhere we've been taught that humans are super smart animals. We, we're maker smart. We're good at making stuff. But we don't seem to be smart about systems. There's something called systems thinking. And if you are a thinker and you love to go deeper and deeper, check out systems thinking online. It's a, a method of looking at situations more holistically. And it's, it's something I think probably a lot of us could use a lot more of right now. So I'm guessing this is going to be another one that has a lot of comments. Now, if you are tempted to lay out your version of the big plan down in the comments to say, this is what's actually going on, I would encourage you to think more deeply. Maybe lay out your plan and then take yourself out of comfort zone. Right over here into the most uncomfortable place you can take yourself. Be strong and brave enough to strip off your clothes and walk out into that snow and roll in the snow. And the equivalent of that in the comments is to look at your big plan and then poke holes in it. Look and see where you haven't seen that 5G anomaly, where you haven't noticed that your mind 
didn't question the existence of 5G or didn't question the existence of whatever it is in the big plan that your mind over here favors. Because I know we are all smart enough to look at our big plans. And, you know, even if we don't consider ourselves to be conspiracy theorists, most of us harbor somewhere inside of us some big plan elements, some ideas that there is a bunch of stuff going on out there beyond our control. Look at your idea, your big plan idea. Poke holes in it. And instead of this becoming a comment section where a bunch of people are just spouting out the ideas that they've heard, let's make it a comment section where people are showing something that is almost unheard of today, which is to put down your idea and then pull the rug out from under it, undermine it, poke holes, be ultra critical of it. Your own idea, not others. It's very easy to poke holes in other people's ideas. That feeds our ego. Instead, look at our own. If any of you take on this challenge, I would be extremely interested to see what you have to say down there in the comments. And I think it will be an example of the human mind functioning at the next level, where we need to go if we really are going to think of ourselves as smart animals, <laughs> that we aren't just repeating things we've heard, that we are questioning the foundations of the evidence that we find ourselves latching on to. You're probably on to me by now and realizing that these recent videos are about developing more critical thinking. And it's historically, this has always been difficult for humans, and more so today. We are kind of at a crux, I feel like, when the human animal could just go in the direction of what's comfortable and look around it, point fingers, blame, not take responsibility for its own actions. And then each of us, I feel like, we become degraded in small ways that build up because we're no longer claiming one of our most potent human tools. It's, I've seen this again and again out in the woods. Our mind, that is our most powerful tool. If, if we go out into the woods and we have nothing except an attitude that we're going to get through whatever's there. And it doesn't have to be out in the woods. It can be any challenge we're facing. If we have that attitude, that attitude is almost unstoppable. But if we give up our power, we give up our power for a feeling of comfort and security, then we are handing over one of the most beautiful, powerful things we have inside of us and giving it away. So my friends, let's reclaim that part of our mind. And down in the comments, show it. Show it to the world. Take your most cherished idea and blow it out of the water and see what faults you can find in it. I think if people do this, we are going to have a very interesting comment section down there. <laughs> and remember, please respect my request not to poke holes in other people's, unless you ask them permission. Because that poking of holes in other people's things, that's, that's just this mind operating again. It's just looking around, pointing out blame. But if there is something like that 5G anomaly, say, hey, I think I see a place in your big plan idea where you could poke a hole in it. Not where I could poke a hole in it, where you could poke a hole in it. Would you like me to bring it up? And I'd love to see a really respectful exchange down there. My friends, thank you for being thinkers. Thank you for continuing to evolve yourselves. Thank you for being part of this channel. I am honored that you're on this journey with me. So much love to you all, and we will talk with you in the comments.